Hi guys, I'm so glad to be here with you today. I'm really excited to share with you how I actually got into the world of engineering. Um, let me see how to... Here we go. This is, this is my takeaway point for you guys. So if you remember nothing, this is the only thing I want you to take um, home today. It's uh, don't just rage quit, respawn instead. I don't know if you guys play computer games. Yeah? Yeah? So this makes sense to you. Do you tend to rage quit? <laughs> oh no, you tend. <laughs> okay, so the keyboard is still in one piece. Okay, okay, good, that's good, that's good. I'm, I'm glad that survived. <laughs> Very good. So, um, when I was growing up, one of the things that I always wondered about was, how, how, do, how do engineers become engineers? Did they have to be a certain type of person, like evil geniuses with secret layers of supercomputers in their basement? Did they have to have the latest gadget? Or do they have to be like a mathlete? And I'm here to tell you that I was none of those. <laughs> And I became an engineer. So that must mean that the requirement to become an engineer is actually not that out there. So to begin, I'll tell you about my technical background. So this is the part that most people will tell you, and it will look pretty um, and overwhelming if you haven't started that journey. So I just want to caution you with that first. So after high school, I first did an internship at this cute little startup called Amstar. Uh, has anyone heard of it? America's multimedia star. No? I didn't expect you guys to because this little startup is actually my father's company. And at the peak of his company, he had five employees, two of which were my parents. So it was a very teeny tiny company. And uh, what he did was he put in phone systems for startups. And at the time, there was this really cool startup out in Mountain View that uh, had started creating their own email addresses. Um, and so they had hired my dad to install a phone system for them. And ex in exchange, instead of paying money, they gave my father five email addresses to use. And you might have heard of this email address, google.com, oh, sorry, gmail.com. That was the start of it. And uh, it, was, it was one of the most awesome things to see. So, during my summer internship, I did things like assemble computers, I assembled phones, I went and helped my dad with installations on site, but because it was a family company, I also did things like take out the trash, I filed papers, I cleaned out the warehouse. <laughs> it was like layers of dust when you walk through the warehouse. And it was all a part of the character building that you're not going to get on, in a classroom. Um, what did it mean to go into work and do things that helped the company without being told? That was where I got that background from. So after that summer, I went to San Diego and I got an engineering degree, electrical engineering in um, a bachelor's in electrical engineering, and I also picked up another internship. This time, I did not have to take out the trash, so that was a plus. And then afterwards, I took my electrical engineering degree, and I went to work in defense at Lockheed Martin, which is, I think, like one road over from here, um, which was pretty fun. But I started to miss school. <laughs> I missed the structure of it. I missed getting feedback from our teachers. And so I started taking classes um, for a grad degree, and pretty soon uh, parted ways with Lockheed in order to finish my degree um, in management science and engineering. And after that, I tried to come up with an idea of what could I try that is totally opposite of defense. So I went into something called the semiconductor industry, um, and I started working as a packaging engineer at Broadcom. So, I mentioned earlier I started my career as an electrical engineer, an electronics engineer, and uh, I got to work on some pretty amazing projects, one of which is this missile. Uh, this missile probably, if I brought it in here, we'd have to expand out to that wall, and we would just fit one. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing. 
If you see the breakdown of it, it's actually three missiles plus a computer inside it. And I got to work on one of the, one of the boxes inside this computer section. And so this kind of missile is called an ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile. And what it does is you launch it from the ocean, from a submarine, and it does a little turn in the air, and it goes up out into space. So it's got to survive the water, it's got to survive the air, and it's got to survive space. A lot of very complex environments to think about. Um, so there's a lot of people working on it, and my job was to build one of, the, one of the boards. Now, this is not the actual board, because that's confidential. This is from the internet. <laughs> but it's pretty close. <laughs> so don't worry, you're all safe. <laughs> but um, when I left that to go finish my degree in um, management science, I wanted to try something different afterwards. And the thing with missile work is you really can't bring that home to show mom. Um, and I couldn't bring mom to work because she wouldn't get the clearance. So I thought, okay, where, where, what could I do? What kind of job could I pick up where um, I could bring what I worked on in my pocket home and show my mom? And so I became a chip packaging engineer. And when I say that to people, a lot of times people think this. Whoa, <laughs> you make that chip, right? Those tubes with a nice snappy top. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, these chips are great but I make a different kind of chip. These ones, these little ones that go into your cell phone, um, that give you, exactly, that give you Wi-Fi access, that if you have um, an Apple, it gives you a airdrop, you can airdrop a picture to somebody, or maybe you have that fingerprint reader. Um, even the ones that you don't have to plug in to charge, you just place on a mat. I got to work on all of those things, and it's, it's been amazing. So, but when I tell you packaging engineer, it's kind of like, what, what, what is that? So in order to explain it to you, I need to tell you, how do we build chips? So we live in this area called Silicon Valley. Does anyone know why it's called Silicon Valley? Yeah. Yes, first hand. Yes, it's one of the, yeah. Right, right. All the devices that we make, we usually build them on something called a silicon wafer. So let me show you. So when you go to build a chip, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to first write down your circuit on this thing, on this wafer of a silicon. So it's like the silicon is kind of like a piece of paper, and you're writing your message on it. And you'll see in this picture, there's a lot of the same squares over and over and over. And what happens is you write one message, and you write it a bunch of times. Each one of those squares will become a chip. So now you've written down your message. Now you've written down your circuit. You're done, right? That's it. I can go home. No, because you essentially did this. And in each phone, you don't need 50 copies of the same thing. You just need one. So now you've got to think of, OK, how do, I, how do I chop it up and get my one chip out? So you, you slice it. And then now you're left with a very small chip. And I want to I kind of help you understand how small it is. So hold out your hand. And I want you to look at that pinky. And then look at that nail on your pinky. That's as big as one of these chips. It's very small, and it's very fragile. So even though this chip will do what you want, the problem is uh, humans are clumsy. <laughs> so for instance, how many of you have ever dropped a cell phone? Ooh, that's a lot of you. <laughs> how many of those cell phones actually survived? OK, so still some, that's pretty good, that's pretty good. How many of you have left your cell phone out in the sun and it got hot? Your dad did. So, guys, these chips take a lot of effort. <laughs> Please take more care of it. <laughs> but you see, like, you got to design it in a way that your main user can use it in the normal way. Like, we are going to drop things. We are going to forget things in the sun. So in order to protect it, you had to do things to protect the actual tiny chip. And that's where 
you package it. So you, maybe you put on a metal cap to make sure it stays cool. Uh, maybe you put plastic around it so that when you do drop it, it doesn't break. Um, and all of this, throughout this whole thing, uh, this is what a packaging engineer is responsible for. So going back to missiles versus chip, as you can see, that tiny chip, the size of our pinky nail, you can definitely put it in your pocket and bring it home and show mom, which I did, but she was not that impressed, and it's OK. <laughs> At least I got to share it with her. <laughs> so if you, if you followed my tale so far, it sounds pretty simple, right? Pretty smooth. Go to school, get some internships, choose jobs. But in actuality, my path to engineering, that's all on the surface level, that nice top of the iceberg level. What actually started me down this path was failure, a whole lot of failure when I was about your age. So um, in fourth grade, I learned that I could not do math. It took me a long time to figure things out. And a problem like this would stump me. In fact, this is the actual problem that changed my world. Um, my teacher had assigned a ditto of how do you arrange numbers to get the largest, to get the smallest. And what I did uh, was just randomly write in numbers. I didn't understand. So when my teacher asked us to um, come up to the board one by one to answer questions, I definitely did not look up at her. I didn't know the answer. Don't ask me. Don't pick me. Uh, of course, she picked me. So uh, you can't refuse, right? You have to go up there. So I go up to the board, and I look at this question. Arrange the numbers 0 through 9 to get the largest integer. And I was like, what is that? Is it 21? It's not 21, right? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I wanted to cry. I, but I, I was up there already. The whole class was watching me. I was just sweating. Gosh, what's the answer? What's the answer? All of a sudden, for some reason, it clicked in my head. Wait a minute. Nine is the biggest number here. I'm going to write that down first. And slowly, I was able to figure out on the spot in front of the whole class what the number was. And it was such a great feeling. What do you guys, do you guys know the number? Right. Yeah, it's that, it's that. <laughs> I mean, because we know how to do it now, it's easy. But when you first learn it, it's pretty, it's, it seems impossible, right? Yeah, you just put the numbers from the largest to the smallest, and that's the largest number you're going to get. So it was at that moment that I realized, hey, I can, I can solve this. I could figure it out. Math is not unachievable. And if you thought that, oh, that was my light bulb moment of, hey, I'm going to be an engineer now, uh, it, it did not, that, that did not happen. Because the year afterwards, um, we got the science teacher. Uh, he was kind of unconventional. <laughs> and I didn't understand how he taught things. So what he would do is he would release us to figure out things on our own. And he didn't quite explain what the final answer was because he was hoping we'd get to it ourselves. I couldn't learn like that. Um, it took me a while to get used to it. But that meant that all my grades for the first half of the school year were like Ds and Fs. Now, which mad scientist do you know gets Ds and Fs in science? It's unheard of, right? But uh, I never got a light bulb moment with science. Gradually, by the end of the school year, I did manage to pass science and understood what the concepts he was trying to teach. It was just, it wasn't that clear as this math. But it didn't mean it wasn't a part of my toolkit anymore. So now I've conquered science and math. Smooth sailing, right? No, there was more. So the next thing that happened the following year in sixth grade, um, I got kicked out of the class. Not, not of my own doing. What happened is there's this program called gate identification. You guys still have that? You do? Yeah. So uh, apparently, you can go pay for a test, uh, take the test, and if you passed, you get this credential of I'm gate identified. And it didn't matter if you ranked in the top of the class or the bottom of the class, you were guaranteed a seat at the table, at least for my school district. 
So my parents didn't know about this test, and I never took it. And it just so happens, between fifth grade and sixth grade, a lot of new students came in. And there happened to be exactly the number of students um, to push me out of the class. There was exactly 30 gate-identified students. So as told to me by my school principal, get out. <laughs> it's like, OK, rules are rules, fine. But it was devastating because I had grown up with these students. I had spent six, seven years with them. And I knew, I knew which ones were smart. And I knew which ones didn't quite understand. I knew which ones where I ranked in that class. And I wasn't the bottom. And yet, I was asked to leave. I was the only one asked to leave. I was placed in a class that, as much as I appreciate my sixth grade teacher, it wasn't challenging. And I had to watch all my friends learn and grow without me. So it was, it was quite a setback. But that's what motiva motivated me to work really hard in seventh grade and eighth grade and ninth grade to earn back every single class that I got that was removed from me um, in, this, in this change. So seventh grade, I earned my way back into the honors math track. In eighth grade, honors science. And finally, in 10th grade, um, honors English. So I was back. Every single class that was accelerated, I got in. It's like, yeah, that will show them, right? But you see, the thing is, the, the person I had to prove to most that I belonged in a challenging class, that I could take a challenging class, was me. And it wasn't until 11th grade um, when it finally clicked in my head, hey, I can do this. Um, I, my high school was Mission San Jose High, so not a joke of a high school. And um, I remember my honors math class, 11th grade, when the teacher finally posted the final grades on her door, I saw that I had earned a 99.4% at the end of the school year. She had way more than 30 students. I'm not, I, I don't have to be the student that is left off the list. I can be the student that's on that list without going through a back door. And that felt so good. And that felt so good. So, my message to you is, if I had given up in fourth grade, when I was getting C's, if I had given up in fifth grade when I didn't understand the teacher's style, when I had given up, if I had given up when the school told me I didn't belong, I wouldn't be able to choose engineering when I applied for college. The, the advice here is not you must choose engineering, no. It is just stay in the classes that will give you the options to choose or to not choose. That's what you want. You don't have to dedicate yourself to one path already, but you need to give yourself options, right? So that's why I want to encourage you to not rage quit. <laughs> I want to encourage you to respond, to try again, especially when it gets tough. Just like when you're learning a new computer game, the first couple times you're going, you're, your character is probably going to die right away, right? And you'll never get good at it if you just ah, rage quit and leave. You got to get in there, try it again, and, uh, and just like give yourself time to learn. So this piece of advice also goes out to the moms and the dads out there. Um, I just want to say, if you haven't heard it recently, you're doing a fantastic job. You are spending your very precious Sunday morning here with your student to invest in their future. And that is fantastic. So um, I want to share with you, yes. Absolutely. I want to share with you uh, my parent, my mom, uh, how she invested in me. She played a key role in the longevity of my journey. Uh, and this is how she describes raising me. <laughs> she said, she'd always say, you were just like a large stubborn bull, and I just had to push you up the hill. And my mom's very petite. So <laughs> she's saying this visual of always pushing you, pushing you, pushing you, even though you didn't want to go there, or you felt like you didn't belong, or you just wanted to quit. Um, but I'm glad my mom didn't uh, give up encouraging me and challenging me to, to really reach high. Because um, she, she does all these, like the most, the smallest gesture 
of what she did became such an influential part of my life. So I'll give you an, an, an example. When I was young, we used to have bookshelves that collected knickknacks over time. Nobody cleaned it. It was just a collection. And once in a while, I'll go and try to organize it myself, try to put some order into this chaos. Um, by no means was it a, a success. It, sometimes the end result was worse than what I started with. But every time, my mom would come over at the end and admire my work and say, Mel, she calls me Mel, Mel, I think you're good at organizing. I don't know if she really believed it or not, but I believed her. <laughs> And so that became a part of my character. To this day, that is something I have to fall back on when I get anxious or nervous. I knew that at least I was good at organizing. At least mom says I'm good at organizing. So even the smallest little encouragement can become a part of your student's character. And I just want to say, keep at it. I know you will continue to encourage your students because that's what moms do. Um, and I want you to also Help us push the bulls up the hill, no matter how tough it gets. <laughs> All right. So at this time, um, I'm going to ask for three volunteers, because I want to illustrate my OK. One, two, and three. Yes. And then uh, your friend to the, yeah. So each volunteer, I want you to bring two friends. It could be your parent. Could be your parent. OK, why don't you stand right here in the front? OK. Who is team, team one, team two, team three? OK, great. So what I'm going to do is each one of you is going to get a, a number of balloons to hold. So you get one. All right. I will give you the balloons. Gonna, you're going to get two. Actually, I'm going to give you three. I'm going to give you three. OK, the rest is all yours. <laughs> you got this? She's got this. OK, you got this. You got this. All right. You got five balloons to hold. Now, this is what the illustration means. Each one of this, these balloons is an investment of your time. This might be math. This might be science. This might be art. It could be anything. Um, so you see, we have one who's dedicated to just one topic, three, and then five. Now, life is not just going to let you walk around with balloons like this easy peasy. So, moms and friends, this is where the fun comes in. So, let's have, let's have you go first. I want you to, to stand right here. Mom on one side, friend on the other side. Okay. You're going to have to hold on to that balloon. Mom and friend are going to play dodgeball and try to dislodge that balloon from you. Oh, no. And they get 30 <laughs> seconds. Please don't hit my face. Don't hit her face. <laughs> try to get the balloon out of her hand. Pretty good, huh? Pretty easy, right? <laughs> Whoa, not bad. Okay. Well, okay, okay, good, good, good. Thank you. Thank you, life. So you see, one balloon. Right on. You did it. You held on to it. That, that, you did excellent. So now. <laughs> see, life, life is tough. Sometimes what you planned to do might get a little tricky. Now, three balloons. <laughs> Want to try? <laughs> All right, come over here. <laughs> and then I want you to face the camera so they can see. And then, friends, you get one and you get one. Don't hit my face. Okay, so just try to hang on to it. Okay, ready? Go. <laughs> hold on to it, hold on to it. You got it, you got it. Oh, hold on to your balloons, hold on to your balloons. <laughs> Oh dear. Even with me. Okay. So it was definitely harder. So it was much harder, right? It's much harder. Okay, now 
the super challenge. <laughs> are, you, are you able to hold? Wait, no, wait, hold them. <laughs> <laughs> you, you want to use your toes to hold it or your teeth? There you go. There's some. There you go. All right, ready? 10 seconds. Go. Whoa! <laughs> that was really good. <laughs> Four, three, two, one. All right, good, good job, good job, good job. That was good. Are you okay? <laughs> All right, so, so you 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 were able to hang on to three, which was really good. That was very good. Okay, now the second part of this illustration. So what's this? That's the second part. This one, this one, you can't do anymore because you dropped it. So. Now I want you guys to pop the balloons. Okay, here. Inside you're going to get action items, and you get to pick one to do. So we're going to start with the five balloons here. Step yeah. <laughs> and one more. All right, great. All right, open, open the, the, the activities that you have in your hand. And you get to pick one, but you must execute on it. Just, just you. Um, to do it, but you can all pop it together. Yeah. All right, so, boys, what did you get? Tell me, tell me your options. What's the first one? Tell us your favorite color. Tell us your favorite color, or? Stage. Lick, <laughs> lick the stage. No. What's the next one? I got, um, show us your highest jump. Show us your highest jump, or? Uh, pretend you're a T-Rex eating a sandwich. Okay. So you gotta pick one, and all of you gotta do it. Which one is it? Do you want to just do the, the, the favorite, favorite color? Favorite color. Favorite color. All right, three more seconds. Three, two. One. Favorite color? Okay, what's your favorite colors? I like green. Green? Blue. Blue? Turquoise. Turquoise, nice. Very good. Thank you, guys. You did it. All right, our next team. Three balloons. Ready? Woo! <laughs> and the final one. Good. All right, what are your, what are your choices? Uh-oh. Lick the stage. Pretend you're a T-Rex. Pretend you're a T-Rex. Show us your highest jump. Show us your highest jump. Which one? You want to lick the stage? I don't want to do that. I don't want to lick the stage. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. No, don't lick the stage. There's, there's too many bacteria. Don't lick the stage. Pick a different one. I encourage you. Okay, let's do Okay, three more seconds. Three, two, one. All right, show us your highest jump. One, two. Nice. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay. Your one option. What do you think it's going to be? Okay. Probably something weird. Lick, lick the stage. Lick the stage. Oh, no! I got this. No, no, no. <laughs> Don't lick the stage. So this is the thing with options. It could have been a, a great. It could have been a great option. It might have been the T-Rex one, but in this case, it wasn't a great option. And that's what I wanted to show you guys today. Keep your options open. You don't know how it's going to end up when you apply for college, and if you can get more balloons, but not too many balloons, then you're going to have an easier time to decide. You get options. So uh, I don't want you to lick the stage. And what I'll give you is uh, popsicles and no, but lollipops instead. Yay. So. Yay. Thank you. Thank you, Mom. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you, guys. All right, in closing, 
Um, all of this is to remind you that you, just because you fail once, it doesn't mean it's the end of the game. There's a lot of potential that can still happen. And I want you guys to remember, five balloons, three balloons, one balloon, try to find that middle ground. Um, and with that, if you have any questions, I'll open up the room to you. All right, so we do have time for a couple of questions, but she will be here for a little bit for lunch. So if we don't get to your question, please ask her when we have lunch. So. Is there a microphone for her up here? Hello, my name is Regine. I'm actually a computer engineering student up at UC Santa Cruz. Oh, nice. I'm also, um, so, yeah, <laughs> so just like a little bit about me. I'm, um, I'm actually a girls who code instructor, so I need to teach all these awesome. girls to code. Yeah. I'm also, I also became the regional champion for girls who code. Nice. Um, I'm also part of the UC president's general model thing and that I have to do. And I also did a TED talk on, about these girls recently yeah, nice. about how important it is to teach your daughters how to code. Now, these girls are so amazing. I've enjoyed working with them in the past year. And they're always constantly asking me um, about internships and how can they be more involved. I know age is a very, very um, deciding factor if someone yes. gets a internship yes. or not. And I saw that firsthand when I was applying for Google and mm -hmm. Twitter and all that stuff. They're like, wait, you have to be a junior, but you're only a sophomore. So what is a good way to kind of break through the industry, especially at the age that these, yeah. um, everyone here is, like usually everyone's here in middle school, I believe. So what's a way they can do that? Internships are hard to get, and I will tell you it's going to get harder. Um, there is a change in the industry, a ch an attitude change recently. Um, if you're not getting internships your freshman year, your sophomore year, don't sweat it. Uh, a lot of times companies are looking for somebody to c bring in as an intern their senior year in order to hire them on after they graduate. And that being said, there's other ways to get exposure. Um, what I do see a lot of students doing is volunteering which uh, has its pros and cons, but it'll get your foot into the door. It'll get you a bullet point on your resume. Um, when you are in junior high, I'd hope that you would spend the summer playing. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> um, I, think, I think it's important to build up that, that aspect of life as well. Um, but your play could be tied with technical stuff. If you enjoy designing websites, that's great. If you enjoy hanging out with your friends, that's great too. Um, it doesn't have to be one or the other. Uh, another way to get internships is network. So I'm talking to uh, those of you who are in college. Um, there are IEEE groups um, and local women's network groups that if you can, if you can get into that, there's a lot of resources there. Uh, they know which companies are looking, and they're able to connect you with somebody. I will say that both my internships came from people I knew. So you need to have a way in through a person. And that's the best that I can advise you on. But good question. Good question. Any other question? Yeah. It was very important. It was very important. I mean, like, communication was why I was in this problem in the first place. My, my, <laughs> my parents didn't know about that test because they, didn't, they didn't, didn't get a chance to talk to my teachers often. So, I mean, from the get-go, a miscommunication put me on a different path. Um, I also found that my skill was, uh, compared to the other engineering students in my classes, I had better communication skills. So I wanted to lean into that, and I took classes like presentation skills, um, speech, just to kind of fill that area in. Um, and I do think that as an on-site application now at, in my workplace, um, a lot of times, Projects run smoother when you're able to communicate better 
there's less back and forth, there's less wasted time. So communication is still a key part. Um, when you have your technical skills, you still need an under, underlying layer of um, communication as your foundation. Oh, so good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I will wrap it up with one more question for you. Um, so, and she will be here for a little while longer, so don't worry. Everyone will have a chance to talk with her and get her autograph in just a little bit. Um, but so my question for you is, you have had a career path where you've gotten to do quite a few different things, which is really exciting. Um, so what words of advice would you have for these students as they're thinking about their future career, especially when you think about the fact that you may not necessarily have a job that you initially thought you would? Yeah. Actually, most people don't get a job that they thought they would get. Um, I have classmates who ended up being lawyers or doctors or teachers. Um, it's, it's not, like how could you know what you want to do in 30 years when you're 13 or 14? 30 years is a long time. Things change. Uh, so when you're deciding these things, like what do I want to major in, you don't need to worry so much about this is going to decide the rest of my life. Like, it, it, it's significant, but it's not the end of the road if you pick the wrong one. Um, you are all very smart students. So when you decide you want to switch or you want to investigate something else, I'm confident that you can do it. And it's not one of those, like, I must choose the one path and stick to it. You have options all along your whole life. So I um, hope that answers your question. All right, let's give one big round of applause for Melissa again.